George Sedano, host of Sedano Heard 7 to 9 weeknights right here on 104.5 The Team ESPN Radio. And George LeBron hits the game winner yesterday. And that that shot just stands for everything that he is. I mean, that is going to be added right to the top of his legacy, isn't it? Yeah, and he wanted to make sure everyone knew that. Uh, I, <laughs> look, the one thing I know about LeBron is that he hears everything. He knows everything. He's very calculated. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I mean that in a smart way. Um, and he's heard it over the years. Oh, you're not clutch. You're not this. You're not that. You can never compare to MJ. Well, now he's hit as many buzzer beaters in the playoffs as MJ. And he wanted to make sure everybody knew that. How big is it that this LeBron James is saying, no, the ball is going to be in my hands. I'm not going to inbound it. That's the other part of the narrative, right? That he didn't want to have the ball in the big moments, that he always passed it up, even though what he was doing was really just kind of making the right basketball play in those situations. But I think that he realizes, I don't have Kyrie out there at full strength. I don't have Kevin Love. You know, there's there's not much of a decoy out there outside of JR. Uh, so, and you know what? There's only one second left. You might as well let him take the shot. Um, so... Yeah, like, I think that all that stuff, again, is about that narrative that was created about him, and he wants to try to dismiss it as much as possible. George Sedano with Armin and Levac on 104.5, the team, and George, he changed the play that David Blatt called. That's that's what you expect in a superstar, right? I mean, that's kind of adds to his legacy, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, look, that stuff happens from time to time. Uh, you know, superstar, transcendent athlete types, especially in that sport, will change the play. I don't know how many times it happens in the actual huddle where you're just kind of like, nah, we're not doing it this way. We're doing it this way. Um, generally, a lot of that stuff happens after you break the huddle. You're like, all right, guys, look, this is what we're really going to do. Uh, so, uh, But I'm not saying it doesn't happen very often. But, again, it goes to show you about LeBron's awareness. I don't think he has very much use for David Blatt. I don't think he's ever really had much use for David Blatt. That wasn't his guy. And throughout the season, we've seen signs of him not having any use for him. And that was just another incident where you can say to yourself, uh, LeBron has all the power. I'm in charge. I want people to know it. And this guy, whatever, he just is an ancillary piece. Is it win a title or you're out, David Blatt? Um, you know, I talked to some guys who are closer to that situation who tell me that if they get to the finals, he should be safe. Um, but... I don't, I don't know if we can buy any of that right now. I think that's all speculation. I think that if, unless he wins a championship, I think, yeah, he may have to worry for his job potentially. Man, he looked like a noob trying to call that timeout at the end of the game, didn't he? Oh, my God. It was, like, uh, it was, it was so funny because as I'm watching it, you know, there was that story that Brian Windhorst had earlier this season that Tyron Lue was the guy calling timeouts. And, you know, Blatt dismissed that. And it was such, you know, it was made kind of a big deal at the time. And then we look and see, and it's like, yeah, now we know why Tyrone Lue was calling the timeout. <laughs> that, that shot from LeBron, <clears throat> did that seal the fate of the Bulls? I think so. Look, I didn't like them in the series to begin with, even without Kevin Love. I just think that as, as good as they've been offensively this year at times, they still don't have a great offensive system. They've got more weapons than they've had in the past, but none of none of the things they do on offense says to me, oh, my God, that's going to rattle Cleveland's defense, which is their weak link, to be honest with you, Cleveland's defense. And Chicago is a, a bunch of individual guys who are trying to play together, even though they're talented on offense. And then there's been a drop on defense. Even though, yeah, they played better defensively in the postseason, but look at the, who they're playing. I mean, Milwaukee's not a good a good offensive team, and and Cleveland is a shell of itself with the injuries and obviously Jr. missing the first couple of games. So I just think that Chicago's defense is not as good as it used to be, and their offense is a little disjointed and just not good enough. So yeah, uh, I think that LeBron put the nail in the coffin in them. I think they win in Cleveland and then they wrap this thing up at six. 
Armin and Levac, 104.5, the team with George Sedano of the Sedano Show, heard from 7 to 9 right here on 104.5, the team, ESPN Radio. And then you go to the Clippers-Rockets game in Game 4 yesterday, uh, George, and it was a game in which... Uh, Hacke, DeAndre Jordan, over and over and over, 128 to 95. The Clippers over the Rockets. Should that rule change, or is that just part of the game when you're fouling at the end? No, the rule should absolutely change. Look, here's the reality, guys. We've changed rules in that sport plenty of times, okay? Ten years ago, you uh, they instituted the rule where you couldn't hack a guy within the last two minutes. Uh, because if not, it'd be free throw and, and possession. Um, so if we could do that 10 years ago, what's the thing we could just do away with it? Uh, I, I think it's not good for the entertainment value of the game. The fans hate it. I guarantee a lot of people got turned off by it yesterday and probably just flipped away because it's Sunday and there's plenty of other options on television. So, yeah, I, I think you can absolutely do away with it. But it can work right now, right? No, it hasn't worked. It didn't work with San Antonio. Um, here's the thing. The Clippers get an offensive rebound off that, off one of those DeAndre misses, one out of every five attempts. That's by far the best average in the league in those situations. So you're doing it against a team that's really good at rebounding. Like, I don't understand why you would want to do that knowing that the guy can't hit the free throws. So it's really not advantageous to do something like that. But isn't it, isn't it like the best way to stop the, the hack of Jordan or hack of whoever – to, to do better than 11 of 28 free throw shots in the first half? Yeah, I guess you could do that. But, again, this is about a bigger issue here, okay? This is about what people want to watch. Nobody's going to an NBA game to watch a free throw shooting competition, especially when the guy stinks at it. So I think that's, a, that's kind of the bigger issue here. George Sedano with Armin in the back, 104.5, the team. You're home for New York sports. Uh, the way that the Clippers beat the Rockets in game four, do you think that series is done? Yeah, yeah. Listen, when they lost the, the game without Chris Paul in Houston, that series was over then, yeah. I thought. Um, look, if you look at Houston, guys, they're really predictable on offense. A lot of high screen type uh, action in their offense. Everything kind of starts at the high post. And this time of year, man, you got teams game planning for you. There are no back to backs. There are no crazy flights, you know, three games and five nights or five games and seven nights. This is you and the other team, and you have plenty of time to scout. The whole next day is all about scouting. And it becomes a lot easier to figure you out if you're that simplistic on offense. Plus, you got two players who, as talented as they are in Harden and Dwight, they have too many shortcomings. Dwight is in his own head too many times. Harden uh, is a little too finesse to be a number one. Obviously, defensively, he's not very good. So I just think that you have that mixture, plus Kevin McHale, as I mentioned, the simplistic offense. It's just a bad recipe. Yeah, they're done. They're toast. I, and, and you know what? i got to be honest with you. I'm thrilled about that because I love seeing Steve Ballmer go absolutely nuts in the stands. He's the, fe- he's the best thing that ever happened to the NBA since Mark it's Mark Cuban. Like that, he is the guy you want to watch every single time that his team is playing because he's a crazy person. <laughs> George Sedano, host of Sedano Show, 7 to 9, every night right here, 104.5, the team. Uh, of course, when uh, the Yankees are in here, right on, right here on your own for Yankees. So, George, uh, the Which one. Which probably never, right? Because baseball is like every night. Like uh, once every other week? Yeah. We, we got you <laughs> jamming proud? But but they're. Well, in the... I'm glad that you guys. I'm glad you guys still want me on, even though the show's on like once every like 14 days. Well, the thing is, the Yankees are on like a, a 50 game stretch right now, so it's not long before you're on like every night while they have to take their breaks. <laughs> All right, sounds good. I look forward to those emails once the Yankee season done. I'm so glad George is still a part of ESPN Radio. <laughs> this is great. Yeah, we just have him hang out in the building until Yankee season, and then we just throw him back in. That's exactly what we do. Uh, Hawks, Wizards, Warriors, Grizzlies tonight. Which number one seed is more likely to be in a 3-1 deficit after tonight? Uh, that's a great question. Um that's a really tough one. I'm really bad at these questions because usually the team I say is the complete opposite. That's the way this usually works out. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to say the Warriors could be in worse shape. And I know I'm going to live to regret that. Watch. I know it. I mean, immediately I'm going to live to regret that. 
only because the Hawks um, have been shooting so poorly, and they're missing uncontested shots, like tons of them. I think they've missed close to 100 uncontested shots in this series, and they're one of the best shooting teams in the league. So it, it isn't much about what the Wizards are doing defensively, just the shots aren't falling. Whereas with Memphis and Golden State, even though, I, by the way, I don't think either of those teams lose tonight. I think both series go 2-2. Two, two. Um, but I, the reason I would pick the Warriors there would be just because Memphis seems to be really pushing them around. And, and I thought that the Warriors were good enough mentally to be able to deal with that stuff. And it just seems like they aren't, they haven't been ready for it since Mike Conley came back. And that, that to me goes to show you how important Mike Conley is. I've been talking about him forever. Everyone always calls him underrated. I'm like, dude, you can't call a guy underrated if we've been calling him underrated for like five seasons. Like, that's just not possible anymore. He's really good. So I, it just goes to show you what he can do because he can lock step down. Obviously, Tony Allen then puts the clamps on Clay, and it just changes everything that uh, that Golden State wants to do. And, and Draymond Green doesn't really have a guy to cover. Um, it's really hard. It's just a bad matchup for them potentially. Is it? That's is that it? Is is are the Grizzlies the worst matchup for the Warriors? You know, I, I, before the series, I would have said no chance because the Warriors just destroyed them. Um, during the regular season, that they won a couple, the games they won, they blew them out of the water. Um, so I was like, oh, Mike Conley's going to be out. Like, this is going to be a five game series for Golden State. And then Conley came back and changed the whole series. Uh, again, remember, Golden State had only lost two games at home during the regular season. So the fact that they lost one is pretty crazy. Um, so, yeah, like, I think it's that. I think it's just a matchup all of a sudden. Uh, it's something that very few of us saw at the beginning. George Sedano with Armin and Levac on 104.5, the team. You're home for New York sports. Uh, what about Paul Pierce over the weekend on Saturday night? 37-year-old Paul Pierce with the uh, game-winning shot at the buzzer. Pretty crazy stuff there, George. Yeah, man. Look, that's just what he does, though. Like he, I've seen that for so many years. Even though he's not the guy there anymore, now he's in a role where he can just kind of take advantage of other guys being open. And he doesn't have to worry about creating his own shot most of the time. Even though there he did a pretty decent job with two guys draped all over him. But I just think in general, he fits really well for that team. And in the preseason, I liked them a lot because I thought that he was going to make the difference. As much as Trevor Ariza was a good fit there, I, I think that sometimes what you need is these battle-tested guys. And obviously, Paul is one of those type of guys. George Sedano with Armin in the back. Any chance that uh, John Wall returns in the playoffs this year? Uh, I, could, I could see him coming back if, uh, you know, depends on how deep they make it. I mean, obviously, I, I, it seems like he's out for this series, uh, though they keep hanging on to this indefinitely thing. Uh, but, yeah, I could see him coming back. Dude, if they make the finals, you don't think he's going to try to play like I do? Yeah, absolutely. I'm surprised they've been, they've been able to hold him back this far. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's the story, right, that him and the medical staff got into it and then Randy Whitman went all crazy on the media for just asking about it. He's a crazy <laughs> person, that Randy Whitman. Yeah. He's like he's like, he's like, like Palmer, but a coach. Like, like worse, like ornery. What, I, I, so I see that you've got, uh, you've got Jorge Posada tonight. I do have Jorge Posada tonight. So for those Yankee fans that don't want to uh, listen to the game for whatever reason, you can just stream my show. I think it's a fair thing. I got no problem with that. Yeah, no. the ESPN radio app and uh, on Twitter as well. You can follow George at Sedano ESPN. You got to ask him if he would grow the mustache with everybody this year. If he would have grown the mustache? All yeah. Right. That's, that's cool. Like, yeah, I would actually, I solicited um, some questions from people. I got like a couple of decent ones, but that by far is the best one. I don't think there's any questions. <laughs> I just want to see what he'd look like with a mustache. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, I, it probably wouldn't look good. I mean, most, very few people look good with a mustache. That's well, fair. And we had former Yankee Jim Lairitz on our show. We have him every Wednesday. And he told us, he said, there's no way that Jeter would have gone with this or, or thought thought that this was cool or let this play out on any team that he was on. Yeah, he's too much of a pretty boy, right? Like, that's just kind of who he is. Like, you know, like, that's, that's the deal. So, um, hey, man, if Don Mattingly could have a mustache as a Yankee, anyone could have a mustache as a Yankee. I mean, back in the 70s and 80s, it was certainly more in vogue to have a mustache. But, uh, you know, whatever, man. Jeter, Jeter's his own guy. Jeter, listen, he doesn't have to worry about anything anymore. Right. You know what I mean? Like, right. he's, 
he could have done whatever he wanted. He might have been the one guy that could, could have gotten away with it just because of the way uh, he was revered. Then. George, what's the punishment going to be like for Brady? Uh, I mean, look, Goodell's probably going to come down hard on him because Goodell does things based on perception. Um, and he knows he's still trying to fight the issues he had when he only gave Ray Rice two games. And I think all that stuff plays in. The public perception matters the most. So I think it's an awful way to rule uh, in those situations. But I think he's going to come down hard on him, uh, like probably anywhere between four and six games, and then it'll get reduced you know, to two or three games or something like that via the appeal. George Sedano of the Sedano Show, 7 to 9, every single weeknight. You can check him out on Twitter, at Sedano ESPN, the NBA Lockdown Podcast as well, and uh, Jorge Posada on the show with uh, George tonight. Sedano, appreciate you as always, man. You're all over the place, really busy, and we always appreciate you stopping by and spending a few minutes with us, man. Thank you.